And as was mentioned, we are in a teaching series entitled Jesus Loves Church. Inclusive of today, we only have three more teachings in this series. So today we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 4. Our heart and our hope is to cover chapter 4 in its entirety. So, chapter 4 is powerful. It's wonderful. It's mystical. It's confusing. It's illuminating. It'll be fun. Um, You know, one of the things we've been doing over the last couple of months, if you find it helpful to track along with the teaching notes, you can go to a a website link that'll be up on the screen in just a moment. It'll look a little bit like this. And you can look at the teaching notes or during the time of teaching or at a later time. And there's also printouts available in the foyer if you find that to be something that's good for starting a fire or it's good for like reading or whatever it's good for for you. It's there for you. But Revelation chapter 1 through 5, as was mentioned, we've been considering this theme as we've been considering these chapters each week. That Jesus loves church. That's right. Jesus loves church. His love is revealed in these chapters for his church. And I had a mentor once who had this phrase when it came to the book of Revelation. He would always say this, Revelation isn't a difficult book to understand, for it comes with a divine outline, he would often say. Does anyone know? This is a pop quiz. I think we can do this in this room, and you can even talk in church. What I mean by that is you can talk to me, but not to one another. That's really helpful on a Sunday morning. But does anyone know where the outline, the perspective, that divine outline is given in the book of Revelation? Where is that divine outline? Chapter 1. Anyone know which verse? 19. Okay, this is what it says. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. There it is. There is the divine outline in the 19th verse of chapter 1 in the book of Revelation that gives us perspective of what to expect in the book of Revelation. Now, this morning, we're we're stepping into that third section. We've considered the things that John saw. That's chapter 1. Someone else who's probably an addicted alliterator said this. That's the person of Jesus. Chapters two and three, which we've considered, are the things that are. That's the people of Jesus, the church. Seven letters written to seven churches. And perhaps you'll remember they all follow a similar pattern of communication. Well, today we will begin the third and final section of the book of Revelation, chapter four through chapter 22. The things that will happen. The program of Jesus. As that mentor often said, Revelation, not a difficult book to understand because it comes with a divine outline. Chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 1, the person of Jesus. The things that he saw. Chapters 2 and 3, the things that are the people of Jesus, the church. Chapters 4 through 22, the program of Jesus. What's coming? And so this morning, we'll begin in chapter 4. We'll see in this program of Jesus a reckoning. We'll see judgment. We'll see wrong being made right and the presence of sin finally being dealt with once and for all. Now, again, if you know your Bibles, if you're a Christian, maybe you've experienced this. Here's more alliteration, I guess, for you. But in Christ, we have been forgiven from the penalty of sin. How many of you guys are thankful for that? Good. Even almost some of the back row is. That's awesome. The penalty of sin is no longer upon us because Jesus said, I'll take it. The power of sin is broken in your life. Truly is. As you surrender to Jesus, as he sanctifies you. Yet the presence of sin is still very real. People still die. Relationships still turn into ghosts where the person's still alive, but the relationship isn't. There's still cancer. 
There's still catastrophe. There's still those who will go into a grocery store in New England and do horrific things. We live in a world that is filled with the presence of sin. It's a reality. Yet one day, the presence of sin will be dealt with. The book of Revelation illuminates that to us, that there'll be a reckoning, judgment, wrong made right, and the establishment of a new heaven and new earth. Let's take a poll. How many are thankful for that? There'll be a new heaven and new earth. Presence of sin is dealt with. That there'll be a reckoning. See, before we get into that platform, that program of Jesus, which really commences in chapter six, we come to chapters four and five. Chapter four is where we are today. We see heaven. We see worship. The reckoning stage is being set. And as we'll see today, the text that we're in today and many supporting texts throughout Scripture indicate and express that the church is with Jesus. That is why in our little series at Coastline Gulf Breeze this winter and spring, chapters 1 through 5 are entitled, Jesus Loves Church. Because in chapters 1, 2, and 3, the word church is used over and over and over and over and over and again. Beginning in chapter 4, at least through chapter 19, you don't see a mention of church. Why is that? Well, as I just shared, I believe this text and many supporting texts throughout the Bible express and indicate that they are, we are with our Lord. Jesus loves his church. So in our time together today, it's probably going to take about 19 hours to unpack all of Revelation chapter 4. So we don't got that time, so we'll do the best we can with what we got. But we will see that immediately after John records those seven letters to the seven churches, a heavenly voice calls him to heaven. And essentially what's happening in chapter 4 is John is describing both his entrance into and his experience of heaven. How many of you guys have ever been there before? You never know. Someone might think they have. I don't know. I've never been there. So this is like, I'm taking this a lot by faith. I've never seen it. I've never experienced this. All the language that we'll see in here. It's powerful. It's descriptive. It's illuminating. It's interesting. And there's something that happens in chapter 4. There's a shift. Any of you guys ever seen a movie? One or two of you? Some people don't like movies. Okay. You know how like sometimes there can be like a vantage points change. The camera shifts from this scene to that scene. Well, in chapter 4, we're looking at earth from the vantage point of heaven. In chapters 1 through 3, the vantage point has been from earth into the things of or from heaven. The scene shifts in Revelation chapter 4. So let's consider this chapter by looking at verses 1 and 2, and then we'll just begin to walk through the text today. If you're new to Coastline or unfamiliar with the Calvary Chapel family of churches, and you're like, well, I'm here for graduation Sunday. Like, you know, I came early. I don't know. I'm just here to get a donut. Like, what are we doing? Our rhythm is to walk through books of the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So you came on a day where we're talking about heaven. It's a good day to be in church. Krispy Kreme in heaven. Aren't those the same thing? Like, I don't know. <laughs> but verse 1 of chapter 4, reading from the New Living Translation, this is what it says. John writing from the first person. Then I looked, and I saw a door standing open in heaven in the same voice. I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Today we're just going to walk through the text and unpack it. Give a little bit of explanation of what we see. One of the first things we see in this text is that there's a door open in heaven. What does that mean? Well, in the Bible, the word heaven is used at least three ways. There's a first heaven, a second heaven, and a third heaven. 
The first heaven is the atmosphere, the skies above the earth, where the birds fly, the clouds float, and where we get our rain and snow. Well, we don't get that here. But Second heaven, that's the celestial, the universe, the realm of the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets. Maybe you're familiar with Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, which says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you ordained, what is man? In light of all that we can see, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is known as the dwelling place of God, where God resides, where he's enthroned, where he renders judgment and where blessings come from. Perhaps you're familiar with Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Our Father who art in... Yeah, that's what it's... He's not talking about... He's on Jupiter, right? There he is. No, no, no. That's the second heaven. He's speaking of the third heaven. And it's in this third heaven that John sees a door. You know what's interesting about that? Pete isn't there next to the pearly gates telling dumb jokes, trying to get you into heaven. You know what I mean? Like, you ever seen any of those jokes? Like, you get to pearly gates, and then there's St. Peter. There's no St. Peter. There's no pearly gates. There's a door. And the door is open. Peter has nothing to do with you getting into heaven. Jesus does. That's why he said... In the gospel account of John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. I am the way. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. One of the next things we see in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, is there's a voice. There's a voice. Speaks like a trumpet blast. Now, I've heard a couple different perspectives on that this week as I've been listening to a lot of sermons, reading a lot of commentaries, books, One person put it this way, that it's not as if there's an actual trumpet being sounded, but the clarity and the loudness of the trumpet is what he's describing. That may be true. Another guy said, well, maybe it's like Charlie Brown's parents. Do you remember that? Like, wah, 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 wah. Like, you can't really make out. It's like, maybe. I don't really know. But I do know this. There was a voice, and it was like the sound of a trumpet. Clear as mud, right? It's clear. And this is what the voice says. Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. I think we've shared with you a couple times that we're excited in the fall to welcome Pastor David Guzik from Calvary Chapel in Santa Barbara to host an Enduring Word weekend with us, whereby he'll do a Friday night event, a Saturday morning event, and a Sunday morning with us. And if you're not unfamiliar with Pastor David, we're going to be talking a little bit about this uh, in today's sermon because we've referenced him a few times. But in that weekend in September, we plan for him to kind of give us kind of like an overview of end times. It's going to be a great weekend. But one of the things he says about this passage I so love that I wanted to share with you. We'll even put it up on the screen. He says this, many see John's going up to heaven as a symbol of the rapture of the church. John was called up to heaven by a voice that sounds like a trumpet, just as the church will be as described in 1 Thessalonians 4. The pattern, he says, is significant. Jesus finished speaking to and dealing with the church in Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. All the churches are comprehended in the seven, and now after dealing with the church, Jesus called John up to heaven, catching him away with a voice that sounded like a trumpet. And all this happened before the great wrath that will be described beginning in Revelation 6. As that great judgment on earth unfolded, John, a representative of the church, was in heaven looking down on earth. Significantly, the word church never occurs in the chapters describing this period of judgment on earth. Nowhere in Revelation chapters 4 through 19. You see, in these two opening verses, we're given a description of John's entrance into heaven. It's interesting. It's exciting. It's mystifying. And we're given a description, as it were, of what many would call the rapture. Now, you may say, what is that? Well, let me read this to you. I found this interesting. One person defined it this way. The rapture is God snatching away all believers, present and past, from the earth in order to make a way for his righteous judgment to be poured out on the earth during the tribulation period. God will resurrect all believers who have died, 
Give them glorified bodies and take them from earth along with all living believers who will also be given glorified bodies at that time. I like that definition. It's clear. It's encompassing of what the New Testament and Old Testament would indicate according to this idea of the rapture. Now, the word rapture does not occur in your English translations of the Bible. Neither does the word Trinity nor the word Bible, but it's in there, if that makes any sense. When Jerome in the fourth century translated the passage from the original Greek into Latin, he used the Latin word raptus, which means to rapture. The term from Latin means a carrying off, a transport, a snatching away. Now, this concept of of being carried off or snatching away is taught throughout Scripture. In the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15 give great indication of this. Let me read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we so will be always with the Lord forever. You know, there's a great scholar known as Kenneth Wiest, who when he translated this passage, he put it this way, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. He says, we will be snatched away forcibly in masses of saints, having the appearance of clouds for a welcome meeting with the Lord in the lower atmosphere. Another author, Pastor Skip Heitzig, he says this, Do you see how this describes the same phenomenon that John experienced? He wrote, immediately I was in the spirit, just as will happen in the rapture. And finally, one other thought on this. One author wrote this. The rapture of the church is a glorious event that we should be longing for. We will finally be free from sin. We'll be in the presence of God forever. This is why I like this. This is why I wanted to read this. There is far too much debate over the meaning and the scope of the rapture. This is not God's intent. The rapture should be a comforting doctrine, full of hope. God wants us to encourage each other with these words, quoting from 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Now, personally, this is where I stand. I firmly believe that the next piece to fall into place on the prophetic timeline of God's program for the world is this snatching away, this catching up, this translation of God's people to be in God's presence. But I will say this, we could spend at least four more Sundays unpacking Revelation chapter four, verses one through two. And so how many of you guys like Kindle? Anyone ever heard of Kindle? It's not a guy, it's a thing that hosts books. Yeah. Well, on my Kindle account, I've got these three books that I've been reading as we've been navigating and preparing and studying this chapter, this series, this book. And I just wanted to recommend them to you. Um, Unlocking the Last Days, you can understand the book of Revelation. And I really love this simple title, Revelation, (laughs) by Greg Laurie. They had so much more content concerning just these two verses, that for some of them, they spent the entirety of a couple weeks unpacking this content. And I wanted to share that with you, because I think it's a doctrine that's meant to bring encouragement, expectation. And another beautiful thing about the rapture of the church is perspective, perspective. God, you love your church. That's why it's part of this series for us, Jesus Loves Church, that before we see this reckoning, before that happens in chapter six, there's this description of heaven, chapters four and five. And John is caught up to be with the Lord. Now, he says that he was instantly in the spirit in those verses. But what does that mean? Let me share this with you. As one who has been raised as a pastor's kid, a graduate from a local private Christian school, 
one who has served for the last 20 years as a kids pastor, youth pastor, executive pastor, worship leader, church planter, lead pastor, one who holds a bachelor's degree in biblical studies, a master in Christian leadership, and an MDiv in the next six weeks. As a licensed Christian worker and an ordained pastor, this is what I would say. I don't know. I don't know what he means by that. When he says, like, I was instantly in the spirit, don't have a clue. Is it kind of like this? Like, maybe you've, like, seen this film before, like, where, like, his body is there, but his, like, spirit is not? Strange, right? Is that what it is? I don't know. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, Paul had a similar experience. And you know how he explained it? Whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. And here's what I would say. If the apostle Paul can use those three words, I don't know. I feel good about using those three words. Like, I don't know. I don't know what this means. But I do know this, that he sees something when he's in the spirit that captivates his attention. Starts with a T, ends with an E, and it rhymes with throne. A throne. He sees a throne with someone sitting on it. See, the word throne is the theme of this chapter. That's why I don't want to spend the entirety of the time looking at the doctrine, that beautiful doctrine of the rapture, or even considering these creatures that we're going to see at the end of this chapter. Why? Because the focus of this chapter is the throne of God, his sovereignty, his complete control. See, the word throne is used at least 14 times in this chapter and 46 times in this book. Why is that important? Because the throne is the thing. It's that thing which most impresses John. It's the centerpiece, and everything else in heaven is described in relation to it. And this is truly theology 101. What is that? There's a throne, and it's not yours. Like, there's a God in heaven who is supreme, who rules, who reigns, and he's, it's never vacant. He doesn't have a vacancy sign on that throne. God is in charge. He oversees. There is a seat of authority and power that the entire universe must answer to. And it's not Thanos, right? It's our Heavenly Father. Who is sitting on the throne? Look at verse 3. He begins to describe the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circle, his throne like a rainbow. 24 thrones surrounded him, and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. And from the throne, just read the first part of verse 5, came flashes of lightning and rumble of thunder. John gives his best description of the one on the throne. Bible commentator and author Warren Wearsby says this about the one sitting on the throne. This is God the Father. How do we know that? Well, the Son approaches the throne in chapter 5, verse 6, and in verse 5 of this chapter, chapter 4, the Spirit is pictured. So the one seated on the throne is our heavenly father. God is on the throne. That is simple. But that powerful truth can revolutionize your current level of anxiety and worry, but only if you will allow it to. God is on the throne. Many of you guys may know Pastor Jess McKernan, who uh, shepherds and serves the church in Destin. You know, one thing that I love about Pastor Jess, he has a three-word phrase that he'll often use. When something comes up, unexpected, and this is what he says, the Lord knows. And you may look at that as like, oh, that's just simplistic living. I don't think so. I think that's the right perspective on everything in life. The Lord knows. The Lord knows what's happening. The Lord's on the throne. God is able. God is capable. He cares. He's involved. He sees. He's got a program. He's got a plan. I can trust him. I can trust him. 
Because every day you are given opportunity to walk on two different pathways, fear or faith. To trust him or to be constantly filled with worry and anxiety about that which you cannot control because that throne doesn't belong to you. It's challenging for us as 21st century American Christians because we live in a culture of being catered to constantly. We have modern day chariots. Some of us have more than one. We have conditioned air in our castles, manicured greenery, swimming pools, entertainment galore that streamed on multiple devices. We have court jesters all the time if we want them. We are catered to like kings and queens in many ways in the 21st century as American Christians. And what can happen in that kind of a culture is you feel like, well, I should be in control. Theology 101, control is an illusion. It belongs to God. Amen. You and I are called to trust him, to obey him, to follow him, to find our joy in his sovereignty. God knows. He's on the throne. See, that's the focal point of this. What makes heaven heaven it's not what we're about to read. All these power, what makes heaven heaven is there's a throne and God is seated on it. And that's what makes it awesome. Amen. Not the streets of gold, not the lost loved ones seen once again, not hair growing back where it used to be, even though that'll be awesome. Like, that's not what makes heaven heaven. What makes heaven heaven is God is good, God is sovereign, God is on the throne, and he has removed the presence of sin. Amen. And that's where you go, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be with him. And he is what makes heaven heaven. The sovereignty of God can revolutionize your stress level, but only if you will allow it. God is the perfect gentleman. He does not force himself upon you. It's like that door. You, got it? you want to come in? There is no possible way for human words to describe what God is like in his essence. So what does John do? He uses comparisons. I'm going to read something to you from pastor and author Skip Heitzig. I just love what he says here. He says this, John tries to picture God by describing at least three kinds of brilliant stones. He mentions jasper, which is clear, diamond-like, spectacular brilliance. He also mentions sardius, or this carnelian stone, a gemstone that's like a ruby. There's a reddish hue. And as he gazes upon the throne, he sees a brilliant white light exploding outward all colored with a reddish hue, perhaps reminding him and the heavenly inhabitants of the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross. And whenever they look toward the throne, they recall the Savior's departure from heaven and the crimson stain that followed, which brought their salvation. John also sees a rainbow, Heitz says, in appearance like an emerald, verse 3. That's the third gemstone. So you could say, sorry, Frank Oz, like there's another emerald city. But like this rainbow... It's not after the storm of divine judgment, but before it. I love that. As if to remind God that he always keeps his promises. Only when God's patience has come to an end will he judge. And even after that future judgment, we can be rest assured that the rainbow, as a promise of God's commitment to keeping his word, will remain throughout eternity. I love that. I love that. See, language fails John in his attempt to describe what he sees. But what he's conveying is brilliantly beautiful and packed with meaning. Now, John sees 24 thrones with 24 elders clothed in white, crowned. What is this about? Who are these 24 guys? How do I get to be one of those guys? In, in 1 Chronicles 24, we see that there were 24 courses of the priesthood that represented all the priests in the Old Testament. Again, quoting from Heitzig, we'll put this one up on the screen. I just love what he says. He says, the Old Testament speaks of 24 courses of priests who served in the temple in Jerusalem near the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of the earthly symbol of God's throne. That's the only other time in the Bible we see this number in a similar context. The 24 courses of priests represented the nation of Israel before God, so it is safe to say that the 24 elders represent the church before God. See, in Romans chapter 8, Paul says that we 
are joint heirs with Christ because we're the church. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes that we will reign with him. David Guzik of this passage says that the redeemed, glorified man sits enthroned with Jesus on lesser thrones to be sure, but thrones nonetheless. So what does this mean? This is what it means. The church is with Jesus in Revelation chapter 4. By representation of these 24 elders seated on lesser thrones, but they're there. And what are they doing? They're enthroned and rewarded. I think Christians miss this. See, what do you mean? That you have a race to be run and your attitude matters. Your gossip matters. Like what you engage in, your attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, engagements, goals, habits, interests, jokes, that stuff matters. How you're running your race, there are rewards to be given. Are you running this race well? Or are you living for a kingdom that's just going to rust and rot and pass away? Is your time, your money, your mental investment, where is it? Which kingdom are you building? I want you to do well in life and in the life that's coming. You ever had a job before? Anyone here? You've had a job? So not everyone in the 21st century in the age range of 18 to 39 have had a job, you know. Have you ever had a job? You've had a job? Okay. You ever heard of like probationary period? It's like first 90 days or first 120 days or first year, or whatever the probationary period is. It's kind of like, all right, you know the job description. Go for it. Let's see how it goes. That's called life. Like you're in probationary period. Does that make sense? Like, I mean, Maximus was right. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Yes, in many ways. How does all that work? There's this guy named Paul, and he had these three words that he would use sometimes. I don't know. I don't know how that works, but I know enough of the New Testament and the Old Testament to say, yes, there is this indication that what we do with our life and our sanctification process with Jesus matters. It matters. Not to earn our entrance into heaven. That's Jesus' job. But what's that job description going to look like when you get there? I don't know. How's your probation period going? What are you doing with what God's given you to steward? You don't run your race in competition with anyone. You run your race with you and Jesus. You are uniquely designed for a unique purpose. That's the race you're meant to run. You only look to others for encouragement, exhortation. Like, oh, I can learn that from them, but I don't have their race. I'm not in competition with them. I'm in collaboration with them. I can learn from them. But man, I've lived long enough to know that life is short and life is long. This is what I mean by that. You're not promised tomorrow. So sometimes, as Dave Ramsey might say, you need that like gazelle-like focus where you, okay, I'm focused. And that's, sometimes you need to recognize, all right, this isn't the right time to repair that relationship. All right, this situation means time and example of love. In order to repair, I can play the long game because I can trust in the sovereignty of God. Life is short, but life is also long for some of us. And wise is the one who learns to trust in the sovereignty of God and live well. Live well. See, these elders symbolize the people of God in heaven, enthroned and rewarded. And from the throne, with these 24 glorified representatives of God's people, we see flashes of lightning and thunder. That's basically called Northwest Florida a couple days ago. We know what that's like. My poor kids, the dog, everyone was up. But what does this mean? I like Wearsby. I think he's a good guy. I can't wait to meet him in heaven. But he says this. These storm signals will be repeated during the time of judgment, always proceeding from the throne in the temple of God. God has indeed prepared his throne for judgment 
Our world does not like to think of God as a God of judgment. They prefer to look at the rainbow around the throne, ignore the lightning and thunder out of the throne. He's certainly a God of grace, but his grace reigns. Please hear this. This is why I wanted to share this phrase. But his grace reigns through righteousness. This was made clear at the cross when God manifested both his love for sinners and his wrath against sin. For God to be God, he must be just. Or he's not God, he's less than. For God to be God, he must be loving. Or he's less than. How does God solve his predicament? The cross. And the final judgment of those who say, I don't want to surrender to the cross. God doesn't send anyone to hell. You choose to go there by rejecting Jesus. See, these are indications of a coming storm. Revelation 4 and 5, it's this space in this narrative known as the book of Revelation. We're getting a glimpse into heaven. And that stage is being set. The thunder is coming, the reckoning, the judgment. The, the, the wrong being made right. We're going to see that all fall. Revelation chapter 6 through 19. We intend to unpack that in August through November. And it's coming. And now, in the remainder of this chapter, I'm just going to be honest with you. This is where it gets weird. You're like, I thought it already was weird. Well, this is where it gets weirder. There's a lot of descriptions given in the rest of the chapter that are descriptions. John uses the word like. It's like. Now, he's not reverting to being a SoCal Valley girl or a preteen teen who uses vocabulary littered with the qualifier. It's like, it's like, it's like, I feel like, um, you know, it's not like that. He's giving the best that human language will allow for to give insights into heaven. So let's look at the second half of of verse five through the end of the chapter and see what he says. If you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus loves church. Okay, you never know. You could be sleeping. (laughs) Verse 5. And in the front of the throne, there were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. I love that clarity. That's what it is. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings covered with eyes, front and back. Well, that's scary. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third like a human face, and the fourth like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they keep keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is and who is still to come. And whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. He really wants to get that point across. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, And they exist because you created what you pleased. Once again, volumes can be written on these verses. We only have 30 seconds left, but we're going to go a little bit longer than 30 seconds to unpack some of what we see. John sees seven lamps of fire and a sea of glass before the throne. Have you ever heard this statement? The greatest commentary on the Bible is good. Yeah, that's good. A grasp and an understanding of the Old Testament gives great insight into what John is seeing and describing. The tabernacle, that tent-like portable temple that Israel used during its wilderness experience, was a model, a picture of God's throne room in heaven. It featured a seven-branched candlestick and a bronze laver of water of God's throne room, in which the priest would wash his hands before offering a sacrifice. In the tabernacle, there was this candlestick and there was this bronze laver of water. Here in heaven, we see seven lamps of fire and a sea of glass-like crystal in front of the throne. The seven lamps picture the Holy Spirit. 
The water, once again, I love what Heitzig says about this. I thought surfers would like this. He said this. The water is solid now, no longer liquid, because in heaven there will be no need for cleansing. Jesus died on the cross, paying price for our sins, and in heaven will stand on the finished work of Christ Jesus. So the crystallized water could be a symbol of the finished work of Jesus. So surfers, there's hope. There may be heavenly waves. Who knows? But I love this idea, the picture that it shares, that the cleansing is done. Christ has dealt with it. From the best commentary on the Bible, the Bible, we see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10 that these creatures may be the same, if not at the very least, related to the cherubim that we know of from the Old Testament. Now, these spectacular beings that surround the throne of God in worship, they're there to worship God and they're involved in his divine justice. Now, cherubim, you ever heard that phrase, oh, she's just like a little angel, and maybe you picture this when you think of cherubim. Like, that's, like that to me looks like Lainey Louise Pearl. I don't know if you know Lainey. She can look like that. She does have blue eyes and red hair. But I have like two scratch marks right here on my like uh, forearm from her just like looking at me yesterday and then going, Argh! and then just scratching me. Like, I don't know why they say babies are like little angels. Have you ever had a baby? No, they're not. They're deceptive. They look like that and then they like come out. But this is not necessarily what the Bible would give description as of a cherubim. Now, there's this guy in Germany who's a 3D artist, motion designer from Hamburg. His name is Jonas Pfeiffer. On his Instagram, he has these descriptions at, from Ezekiel and Revelation that he gives. If you were to try to give, well, what's an artistic rendering of all that we see from the Old Testament and the New Testament of these beings? I'm going to show you two clips, and these are just rendering. Let's show them now. So my wife found those like six months ago or something and she was showing the kids because the kids were like, what's heaven like? What's an angel? And my wife found this guy on Instagram and showed it to my kid and they were like, what the, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> and I was like, hey, listen, um, I'm going I'm to lean on like Paul here. I don't know, like I've never been to heaven. But if you were to give like, well, what's an artistic rendering of what we see here? I mean, that's possible. That, that one right there is more from Ezekiel where there's that head on there. It's possible. That's what John saw. I don't know. I, when I get there, I'll let you know somehow. But like, for now, I have no idea. But I do know that language fails John to describe all that he has seen. And when he gets there, I mean, you could probably understand why when someone encountered an angel, they always had to say, hey, fear not. Like, here I am, buddy. I know I see everything, but it's okay. Like, that's impressively scary, you know. But time does not afford me the ability to unpack all the intricacies and the implications of the meanings of these creatures. They resemble being like a lion, an ox, a human face, and an eagle in their flight, their wings, their eyes. But once again, I would recommend these resources to unpack the meaning of this. These resources are helpful, but also on his website, EnduringWord.com, this is where the link is. Man, he does a great job. Pages and pages and pages of information of how this relates to Ezekiel chapter 1, chapter 10, the four gospel accounts and how they picture Jesus in a way that's like an ox, like a man. Oh, it's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But we're already five minutes over time. So that's why we are where we are. But chapter 4 closes with this vision of worship before the throne of God. And can we at least agree to say this? It's awesome and it's mystifying. There's thunders and lightnings. There's this, this like emerald hue of a rainbow. There's this brilliance of light. There's this red hue. There's one who's seated on the throne with 24 lesser thrones around him. Everyone is just declaring definitively, God, you're holy. 
Like in biblical language, if you repeated something twice that was meant to show emphatically that it's true, to say it three times was like there's no shadow of a doubt. You're holy, holy, holy. Don't get the understanding like this is on Spotify repeat. That's all that's going on up there. It's the only song they play. No, it's just the mindset that when you encounter God, you're like, this is awesome. This is holy. He's perfect. He's doing everything right. It's as it should be. The sovereignty of God can do wonders for your anxiety and worry if you'll allow it to. He's good. He knows what he's doing. And the worship that is described here is overwhelmed by the perfection, holiness, and completeness and power of God. The worship that's described here is comprehensive. What do you mean by that? There's four living creatures from heaven, 24 elders from humanity, and they're all worshiping together. Describing and declaring the worth and value and goodness of the one who lives forever. The 24 elders recognizing the supremacy of God lay their crowns of victory before the one who is enthroned with royalty. And as it says in verse 11, the consensus is clear. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist Because you created them for what you pleased. There is so much meaning packed in that last verse. The shorter Westminster Catechism comes out of that. What's the chief end of man? To glorify God and live for him. You're created for his pleasure, not yours. That's why you're miserable. You're living for your pleasure, not his. As we close this morning, I want you to be reminded of something that we shared often as we considered the second and third chapter of Revelation. God has given us this book not to scare us. Did you see all those eyes, kids? Live for Jesus. Like, oh my gosh. Like, (laughs) he hasn't given us that to scare us, but to prepare us. He hasn't given us the book of Revelation to conceal things from us. What's with all this, like, descriptive language? To reveal them to us. That's why this book is given. And this book is not given to overstimulate our minds in our coffee conversations, but to motivate our hearts and our hands to worship. That's why this book is here. So that we would ascribe worth to God through our work ethic. That work would be seen as a platform where we get to worship God and have impact on others. See, church is meant to be this gathering of God's people, this grouping of God's people, where they're equipped to go and do the ministry that God's called them to do. And your primary platform of worship to God is your work. It does not define your worth. It's not where you find it. Work is the platform by which you worship God. So as you go out this week, worship him. Do the things that please him. Play that short game and play that long game all at the same time. See, in chapter 4, we're beginning to see the things that will happen, the program of Jesus. And the program does include, please listen to this, a reckoning is coming. Judgment is coming. Wrong will be made right. The presence of sin will be dealt with once and for all. It's going to be a gnarly fall for Coastline Calvary Chapel Gulf Breeze because that's what we're looking at, chapters 6 through 19. But as you look at chapters 4 and 5, as we're closing out this series over the next couple Sundays that Jesus loves church, it's like there's this, it's like there's this moment where John sees before all that's going to happen and unfold that the church is with Jesus The heavenly creatures are with Jesus. They're all worshiping him and saying, this is right. This is good. God, you're holy. And before that begins, chapters four and five, we see heaven and we see worship. The reckoning stage is set. And as Revelation four evidences, the church is with Jesus because Jesus loves church.